or even yesterday. Mm. Why is that clear? Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, it never fails, does it? It never seems to fail, right? You get right up to the day of the program, and uh, then the sky goes south on us. Yeah, really too bad. But hopefully, we'll get through the rain over the weekend. Uh, by the time we get to actually see some stuff. Hey, good evening, everybody. My name is Derek Pitts. I'm the chief astronomer, your cool astronomer from the Franklin Institute Science Museum, welcoming you to our December edition of Night Skies at Home. Night Skies at Home, it's a program I hope many of you have participated in before. And if you're new to the program, welcome aboard. We'll take a few minutes for everybody to come on board and join us on the platform. Uh, But this, of course, is Night Skies at Home. Night Skies at Home is the home version of our Night Skies at the Observatory program. That is a really wonderful program where we invite you to come down and join us at the Franklin Institute in the observatory and in the planetarium as well. And we'll use all those great toys that we have down at the Franklin Institute to give you a really great astronomy experience. Use the telescopes, of of course, to look uh, look at whatever's available to see in the evening sky and then use the planetarium to help fill in with all the extra information that helps make everything come alive. We also have activities during the evening and usually a guest speaker as well. And hopefully we will be resuming those in the next uh, six months or so. Hopefully we'll keep our fingers crossed on that. But in any case, this program is the home version of that. While we may not have a planetarium here, there is a planetarium, a natural planetarium that you can use outside. This program is for people who are just getting started in astronomy, but it's also for those who are a bit more advanced in astronomy as well. But it's all about going outside to look at the night sky. And since the sky is already there, it's something that you can do right at home while you might be under quarantine or just staying away from folks uh, for this particular time of this year. So here's a wonderful opportunity for you to learn what you need to know to help you connect with the evening sky. So much is so easy to see, bright stars, planets, meteors, the moon, even satellites are easy for you to see. So we're gonna talk about all of those this evening. We're also gonna set the context for you about this time of the year with the earth and its motion around the sun. We'll fill in with a few constellations and we have a special treat for you tonight. Not only are we gonna review those points that you need to know about how to purchase a telescope for a gift, if that's what you're thinking of doing at this time of this year, but the other thing that we're gonna touch on as well is a really cool topic. What do you think of the science that's portrayed in space films? What do you think of the science that's portrayed in space films? Some people think it's way off the mark, shouldn't be included, ruins the film. Others don't really mind so much and maybe think that the story of the pro of the film itself is not even about the astronomy, but the astronomy just acts as a way to carry the story along. Well, what do you think? I want to know what you think about that. So I'm going to ask you to respond to us tonight by telling us a couple of things. Number one, do you have a famous, do you have a favorite space film? I have a list of 10 I'm going to rattle off pretty soon so you can see which ones I think of when uh, I think of space films. Uh, There's one that's my favorite. Why don't you try to guess which one is my favorite of the 10? I'll give you the list. You tell me which one you think is my favorite, but tell me also which one is your favorite. That's what I'd like to know. And tell me a little bit why about it's your favorite, okay? Just a quick line will be enough to help us get the point. That'd be great. And hopefully we can read some of them during the program here tonight. We'll try to do that. Helping me do that, of course, is my studio engineer and producer, the fabulous Linda. Say hi, Linda. Hi, everybody. She says hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, She's helping tonight. And uh, of course, we have our, our... background studio, uh, the fabulous Katie out there doing the work uh, back behind the scenes. Thanks, Katie. Okay, so welcome again to our program, Night Skies at Home. This is the December edition. We've been doing this once a month for a little while now. We'll continue to do this as long as there's great stuff to see in the evening sky. So let's really get rolling. Don't forget, most important thing I can tell you right now is don't forget to wear a mask when you go out. Please wear a mask when you go out. It's very important. Uh, And uh, the other thing is, This is a program for you if you're just starting out. That's perfectly fine. You don't have to be advanced. We're going to help you learn what you need to know to enjoy looking at the night sky. Okay, so uh, I've just been notified that, you know, my my table is shaking when I tuck and lean on it like this. So if you see that, don't worry. It's not you. It's me. I'll try to damp that out. All right, so let's get started here. Let's get started with the sky phenomenon. What's happening in the sky right now? Uh, so that if the sky happens to be clear where you are, you'll have some things in mind to take a look for when we're done with the program here in about an hour. Okay, so first of all, 
Let's start right out with the sun. The sun right now is rising in this portion of the planet, 40 degrees north latitude, and that does make a difference. Sunrise right now for us is 7.06. That's tomorrow morning, 7.06. Sunset actually tomorrow is 4.35 p.m. 4.35. Now guess what? Today was the first day in which we started sunsets at 4.35 p.m. Now that's gonna continue until December the 12th. What's significant about that? It's the earliest sunset of the year. And as the earliest sunset of the year, it's now getting us into a really interesting season of the Earth's path around the sun. You know, the Earth is on an elliptical orbit around the sun that takes us about 365 days, just about that. It's really a little bit more than that, 365.2425869847236 days. But you know, it's that 0.25 that really makes the difference. We'll get to that in a moment. But right now what's happening is that the Earth is coming to its closest point to the sun. Its closest point to the sun. Right now we're heading around to what we call winter solstice. Coming up when? You know the date, right, December 21st. It's coming up on December 21st this year. And it's gonna happen at five o'clock in the morning, 5.03 to be exact. Now, as it turns out, when the earth arrives at that point, it only sits there for just a brief instant because the earth's motion on its orbit is continuous. So it never stops. So it just breezes through that particular point in its orbit at 5.03 a.m. on December 21st. That's the first day of winter, winter solstice. The Earth will almost be at its closest point to the sun. We actually reached that close point to the sun in early January. And now you're saying, so why is it so cold here in the Northern Hemisphere if we're closer to the sun right now? Well, really the reason why is because the axial tilt of the Earth, that 23 and a half degree number that you've seen throughout your education about the Earth's tilt, that 23 and a half degrees is what does it. As the Earth comes around the sun, the top of the earth is tilted at its greatest extent away from the sun. So the radiation spreads over a much larger area because the top of the earth is tilted away from it. And that means that we don't heat up very much. We don't have enough hours of sunlight to warm this portion of the earth. So it's cold here at this time of year. Now, don't forget the opposite is true for the Southern hemisphere. It's much warmer there because the portion of the earth is tilted toward the sun. And that makes all the difference. So this is how we have seasons. It's that axial tilt that does that. Mars has seasons too, because the axial tilt is just about the same as Earth, but its orbit is a year longer. So that doubles the length of the seasons. So we're coming around to the season right then. We're right now here at the earliest sunrise of the year. I'm sorry, let me say that again. Here we are right now at the earliest sunset of the year. The latest sunrise comes in early January, along with the close approach to the sun. Okay, great. So that's where we are with the sun right now. How about the moon? Well, the moon today is 17 and a half days old. So it's right between last, uh, between full moon and last quarter. We're heading on toward last quarter, uh, coming up pretty soon. We'll have new moon on December 14th, and the moon will be full again on December 29th. So uh, you can watch out for those phases. This is a great time to look at the sun if you can. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, look at the moon if you can. So get out and take a look. The moon rises, uh, it rose tonight at 722 and it sets tomorrow morning at uh, 10 a.m., right at 10 a.m. So that's your information about the moon. Now there are planets visible in the evening sky that we're able to see without too much difficulty. And we also have great constellations as well that we can see. But here's something I wanna just bring to your attention uh, to make sure you don't forget this, you get this on your calendar. We have a really special holiday gathering of planets this year. Yep, that's right. Two planets are gonna pass very close to each other as they appear in the sky right around Christmas. It's gonna actually start to take place between December 16th and December 27th. So over that 11 day period, what's gonna happen is if you can find Jupiter and Saturn low in the Southwest sky at 6 p.m. every evening, you're gonna notice on the 16th, the separation between the two. But that separation will close day after day, right through December 22nd, December 23rd, December 24th. And then the planets will start to separate out again over the 25th, the 26th, and the 27th. So they will look like they're sliding past each other. And this event is called conjunction. 
Conjunction is the word that's used to describe when two planets are at a similar location in the sky. They don't have to be touching each other, but they have to be in uh, aligned in one particular aspect of their position on the sky. And that's called conjunction. For us, it's just when two planets come close together in the sky. So I really recommend you put this on your calendar, something you can get out and view because it looks really cool. You can actually watch the motion of three planets at once. Three. Can you guess what the third planet is? Jupiter, Saturn. What could the other one be? Yeah, it's the one we're standing on. It's Earth. Because the motion that we see of Jupiter and Saturn isn't so much those planets as it is us passing across the sky with the background changing behind us as we continue our orbit around the sun. Remember, the Earth is moving much faster than Jupiter and Saturn are in their orbits. They're so much farther away from the sun. So it's got to be our platform that's zipping past them. And that's exactly what you're going to see as you watch these planets dance around from December 16th through December 27th. Easy to see, no telescope, no binoculars needed, but guess what? It certainly would be a great thing to observe if you did happen to receive a telescope or a pair of binoculars as a holiday key gift. We'll get to that in just a few moments, but yep, that's what to watch out for for the planets. Now we also have some really cool constellations that we're gonna be able to see as well. So we'll get to uh, how we can see those constellations better using certain kinds of maps in just a minute. Okay, so now here's what I'm gonna do right at this moment. You know, we're gonna talk about telescopes and all those things, but I wanna get you started on thinking about those science fiction films, those space exploration films that might be your favorite and what the science, what do you think of the science involved in that? Okay, so. I have 10 films here and I'm gonna just give you the name and the year and just a quick description of it, very quick description of it so that you'll be able to think about and pick the ones you like. Tell me your favorite, tell me which one you think is my favorite. Tell me why you like the ones you like. And if I left one off the list, which I'm sure I did, please let us know about that too. Okay, here we go. These are the films that I thought were interesting ones to talk about for their science content, good or bad. You ready? There's, there are no particular order, by the way, either. So here we go. First of all, 2001, A Space Odyssey. Now there's a real iconic one. I'm sure a lot of you are saying, oh yeah, he started with that one first. Well, you know, it's obvious. It's gotta be on a list. That one was released in 1968. It was uh, directed by Stanley Kubrick. The way I describe that, human curiosity intersects with the realization that we're not alone in the universe. And the science hook, that's something else that I've described for each of these films. Let me know what you think about the science hook or if you have a different one. So for 2001 A Space Odyssey, I have Explorers on the Moon Discover a Monolith of Non-Human Origin. Ooh, doesn't that sound like something you heard about in the news just recently about a monolith being discovered in the desert Southwest of the United States? No one knows how it got there. And isn't it uh, expected that the first explanation somebody would come up with is, ah, aliens must have brought it. Well, don't forget, there's billions of people living on the planet right here who could more easily accomplish something like that than aliens could. Remember, aliens have to come from light years away. You think they identified that point from wherever their home planet is and decided to place a 10 to 12 foot steel monolith right in that location? Ha, huh. I don't know, I don't think so. Anyway, anyway, you heard about that in the news recently. It also then disappeared and then showed up uh, over in Europe. Anyway, let's move on. How about Contact? The movie Contact, 1997. Robert Zemeckis was the director of that. This is a, a film that was uh, written after the story that was written by Carl Sagan. And it's about a young woman, a radio astronomer who has, uh, who has been provided information from an alien civilization that will allow us to travel through space and time before we're really ready. Lots of interesting stuff in that one. What do you think the science hook is for that one? First contact with alien intelligence. Yeah, right, okay, next. The Day the Earth Stood Still from 1951. Robert Wise was the director of this. An alien comes to Earth to warn us about the dangers of nuclear proliferation. Remember, this is 1951, not long after World War II and uh, just the beginning of the Cold War. Turns out 
we're less than hospitable to the alien that comes to warn us. How do you think we'll react when first contact is made? What's the science hook here? An advanced and wiser alien civilization has been watching us from afar. Mm, think about that. Okay, so the next film, The Fifth Element from 1997, directed by Luke Besson. There are bigger forces in the universe, good and evil, and one of them happens to be love. So uh, the science hook there, I say it this way. The film makes space travel look blasé. Hmm, blasé, space travel? Where do you see it if you haven't seen it? Or tell me if you agree or not. Next on the list, from, uh, from 2013, Gravity, Gravity. Alfonso Cuaron was the director of this. Collisions between two spacecraft in Earth orbit require life and death decisions for survival. Inner strength is awesome. Here's the science hook. The Kessler syndrome could happen. If you were with us last month, you know what I'm talking about when I talk about the Kessler syndrome. It's what happens when more than, when a significant number of the uh, satellites in orbit collide with each other, create lots of little projectiles that go out and explode other satellites. And then we have a real mess on our hands, so to speak. Okay, next on the list from 2014, Interstellar. That was directed by Christopher Nolan. In this case, time dilation around black holes is real. Love and commitment can transcend space and time though. And uh, what's the science hook here? If you saw this film, you know what it is. Mm-hmm, that's right. Black holes, baby, black holes, that's what it is. That's the science hook for this film. Of course, from 2015, there's The Martian. Ridley Scott was the director of that. Our first trip to Mars is upended by a Martian dust storm, believe it or not. You can science something really, really well, but you have to know the science to do it. Okay, and what's the science hook here? Science is awesome and it can save you. Yeah, that's good, that's a, that's a really good one. And of course, what list like this wouldn't be complete if you didn't talk about or didn't mention the Star Trek series, both the television portions and the movies and the Star Wars movies as well. Of course, they have to be in there. I know many of you were just waiting for those to turn up. Uh, they are classics for sure and iconic, no question about it. Star Trek started in 1966 uh, with the television programs and Star Wars, the first uh, episode came out in 1977. Now, here are two others that you have to include on the list. Of course, there's Apollo 13, right? That's one that has to be on there, you know, about that mission. Uh, headed out toward the moon, an explosion uh, occurred on the spacecraft, had to figure out a way to get the three astronauts back alive. And of course, Arrived. Maybe you saw Arrived just a couple of years ago. Uh, again, about contact with an alien intelligence right here on Earth. Really, really interesting films, all of those. Uh, so those are the ones I was going to mention to you. Think about those. Tell me which ones you like uh, and why you like them. And uh, also suggest any others that we didn't include on the list. Remember, we want to talk about the science and see if we can uh, find out if the science is uh, is uh, if the science helped with the film or didn't help with the film. Okay, so questions. Do we have some questions? We do. Uh, Eleven-year-old Claire wants to know if you could see all of the planets from the space station. Ha! Huh. Eleven-year-old Claire would like to know if we can see all of the constellations from space station planets. All of the planets from space station. There we go. That's a good question. Thank you very much. So from space station, astronauts would be able to see all of the bright planets, just like we can, we can see the bright planets here on Earth. So that means Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, without too much difficulty. Uh, Mercury would be a challenge because it hardly ever, it doesn't drift far enough away from the sun to make it an easy observation. As far as the others are concerned, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Well, Pluto, you're never gonna see without a telescope. We can just say that because it's so small and so far away. Uranus and Neptune are interesting to see, but they are very, very challenging to see because of their distance. And also because of the fact that their surface brightness uh, is very low. The reflectivity of the cloud tops of Uranus and Neptune don't really reflect very much light. Unlike Saturn and Jupiter and Venus, and Mars as well, that is so bright, these other ones are hard. So I think astronomers would see the same ones we see here. Okay, what's next? Hazel likes gravity. Oh, Hazel, thank you very much. I hear you like gravity. Mara sure. likes the right stuff. Mara likes the right stuff. There's one that we should have included, thank you. Sharon loved contact. 
Uh, Sharon, contact. There we go. Good. And she also loved The Martian. And The Martian as well. Good. Okay. Mitch likes The Martian. Mitch likes The Martian. Thank you, Mitch. And Jenny finds The Fifth Element addictive. <laughs> Jenny, you're addicted to The Fifth Element? Aha, good choice. Very good choice. Mm -hmm. Mara would like to know, she said, we heard there's something called the Christmas star, something that hasn't happened in 800 years. Could you tell us about that? Mara is asking about uh, a phenomenon that's going to happen this year called the Christmas star. If you were with us just a few moments ago, I talked about two planets coming into what's called conjunction, where they uh, occupy uh, uh, a close space with each other. They come very close to each other as we see them in the sky. Well, this particular conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn is sort of resembles a similar event that happened more than 2000 years ago when Jupiter, Saturn, and Venus were all in the same portion of the sky and also came into conjunction together. Well, that phenomena that happened 2000 years ago is what's said to be the inspiration behind the original Christmas star, that star in the sky that the three wise men saw as they were about to make their journey to Bethlehem uh, about 2000 years ago, 2020 years ago. So that particular phenomenon they saw is said to have been a conjunction of planets. All three planets together in the sky would have been an impressive sight and so if you put them all there together, not only would it be impressive, but the other thing is that at that time, any objects that were seen in the sky were thought to be, were thought to be uh, stars rather than planets. So these observers 2000 years ago, 2020 years ago, they didn't know they were looking at planets. They knew that they were looking at very special quote unquote stars, stars that moved. Now let's connect that to what's happening this December. December 16th through December 27th, that conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn is being described again as a Christmas star because it's a similar conjunction like the one that happened 2020 years ago. The last time that this particular kind of conjunction happened was about 800 years ago. So uh, it's a really great thing that we have the opportunity to see that this year because it may be a little while before we see one again. I'll check the information and let you know about that. But that's what we're talking about when we say Christmas star this time around is these two planets that are gonna come into conjunction uh, in that season from the 17th, uh, 16th to the 27th. Okay, yeah. one? Yeah, a couple more. Mike says, how was before Alexa and Siri? <laughs> Who was that again? Mike. Hey, Mike, I understand you're, uh, you're mentioning that uh, that Hal came way before Alexa and Siri. Yes, that's right. That's from 2001, A Space Odyssey. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that reference. That's a really good one. I like that one. Mm -hmm. Yep, excellent. Very nice. So uh, Mitch says, yes, of course, duct tape works in a near vacuum. <laughs> duct tape is magic and should be worshipped. You know, you've got to have duct tape. If you think you're going to take a space mission, you're definitely going to need duct tape. And as you could see, the Marsh in the Martian film, the uh, protagonist in that uh, used duct tape to save everything. So uh, I can't see how a space mission can be done without duct tape these days. Thanks a lot for that. Hey, we got a couple more. Okay, we'll take a couple more questions. All right. Uh, Alan says he liked the Black Hole Disney movie. Oh, yes, right. That's one. Disney's Black Hole movie. Thanks for that, Alan. And Sharon says she loved The Martian because it demonstrates that one can survive with science. There we go. Thank you very much for that. Yep. Peter says space balls all day long. <laughs> space balls. Thank you, Peter. That's one that didn't make it to this list, but should be on that list. Thank you. And Mike says, what about Close Encounters of the Third Kind? Oh, Mike, how could I forget Close Encounters of the Third Kind? You're right. You're right. Well, that's a, that's a, I, I'm sort of thinking, seeing that in a slightly different genre, maybe. No, I shouldn't see it that way, should I? I should put it in with all the other ones. Yeah, that's right. And uh, what was the name of the other science fiction movie about aliens coming to, uh, to Earth here and they came in pods or eggs and uh, they were kept in the pool of a retirement village? What's oh, the name of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Somebody will remember which one I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. It was with mm -hmm. the old people. Right. Don Amici was uh, one of the elderly gentlemen in that program. We'll think of the other ones. Oh, my goodness. Okay. All right. Well. 
You know what we need to do? Let's get on and talk a little bit about uh, telescopes here. We've talked a little bit about films. We'll come back and talk about that a bit more. But I have a couple things I want to show. And uh, so let's just talk about the telescope portion here now and get that out of the way. A lot of folks have been asking me, please tell me, what do I need to know if I'm thinking about purchasing a telescope? Uh, and is it something that I can get done this year as a holiday in, a, in the holiday season as a potential gift? And yes, you actually can get this done. And you ought to be thinking right now about one of the most important aspects of this, which would be, can you get something delivered in time? Can you get something shipped in time? And yes, I think you can get it shipped in time. Just a moment. Cooking. My studio producer here has come up with the answer to the question. Remember I asked about the eggs that uh, were kept in the swimming pool at the retirement home? Well, guess what? The name of the film is Cocoon. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's great. So let's go back to the telescopes again. I was talking about delivery because I'm sure you're concerned about that. You've been hearing stories over the last couple of days how some of the delivery services have a reach capacity for being able to deliver on time. Well, you still have time to get something shipped from uh, some of the manufacturers that have telescope equipment. I'll mention which ones they are and provide that information for you. I'll even uh, show you where you can find it on the Franklin Institute's webpage with that information stored. Okay, let's get on with this. Telescopes. If you're thinking about purchasing a telescope, there are some critical things that you need to think about, th things that you need to figure out to help you decide what's gonna be the right kind of telescope to purchase for the use that's intended. So there are two types of telescopes. There's a reflecting telescope style, which is what I have here. This is a small reflecting telescope and there's a mirror down at the end of the tube there, this tube right here that allows light from a star to be gathered back here and then be sent up to an eyepiece over here on this end where the viewer would look through. So I'd look through right here to see an object in the night sky. This is a reflecting telescope, a small one. Reflectors are really good telescopes. They work really, really well. There's a great value in a reflecting telescope because um, you can get a much larger telescope, a much larger reflecting telescope than you can a refracting telescope for the same price. And it has to do with how the equipment is manufactured. That's what it is. You know, the lenses in a telescope require polishing for several surfaces, four surfaces if you have a really good telescope, because there are two lenses at the front of the instrument that work together to create the image that you want. In a reflecting telescope, typically you have one large mirror and one smaller mirror. So you only really have two surfaces that have to be worked as opposed to four surfaces that have to be worked. So it makes the reflecting telescope a better value, if, uh, if I can say it that way, for the same price as a refracting telescope. Now, refracting telescopes are very good. And if that's a style that you like to use, there's no reason why you can't do that. There are great refracting telescopes on the market, and I'm sure you can find one at a price point that works for you. As it turns out, they actually have slightly different applications. So while both will uh, allow you to see planets, stars, uh, nebulae, and a few other objects like that, the truth is that with a refracting telescope, because you're limited by the size, because of the cost, you can't really use refracting telescopes as well as a reflecting telescope to see galaxies, okay? So now, if you live in an urban area, if you live anywhere around Philadelphia, you're looking for a portable telescope if you're looking for something that you think you'd like to use to observe galaxies and nebulae. So when you think about what you'd like to do, if you'd like to casually look at the moon, look at the planets and look at some bright stars, then a refracting telescope will be just fine. And most reflecting telescopes will be just fine for that work as well. But if you think you'd like to do something more challenging, if you'd like to search for nebulae, clouds of gas and dust, either left over from the explosion of a star or a cloud of gas and dust that might turn into a star at some point, or you're interested in looking at galaxies, those gigantic collections of stars, well, then you're going to need a much bigger reflecting telescope. And you're going to have to take it to a place where the sky is clearer and darker. So this means that you're looking for portability as well. So either one of these types of telescopes will work well for you. Now, where can you find, where can you sort of, what's a place you can go to to learn a little bit more about this or to find a telescope in your price point? Well, here's what I recommend. 
I've mentioned this before. There's a group called Orion Telescopes, and their website is telescope.com, telescope.com. Now, I highly recommend their website because it's chock full of information about telescopes. And the enormous selection that they have gives you an opportunity to see what you might be able to find in your price point. And that's really important because very often we have a budget. And if you've got a budget, you should stick with your budget. But you can find a telescope in your budget line. If you just dig a little bit, you'll be able to find something. Now, the other thing that I should mention about this that I think is really, really, really important in terms of finding a telescope you like uh, and uh, finding a telescope in your price point uh, has to do with the size of the instrument. And this is what's really important about this because typically telescopes are sold according to how much they magnify. You see it on the box all the time. This telescope will magnify up to 500 times. Well, to tell you the truth, honest to goodness, it's very difficult for any telescope to magnify that high. And the reason why is because you really have to have enough light gathering capability. You have to be able to gather enough light to give you an image that then could be magnified to that degree. Typically, most telescopes, most telescopes only operate well up to about 300 power. Now, after about 300 power, guess what? The focus starts to get really fuzzy and the sharpness of the image goes down. The resolution begins to drop off as you gain in magnification. Now, the reason why this is, is because you're actually magnifying the image created by the lens or the mirror. Yes, you're bringing the object closer, but you're actually magnifying that image that's created by the lens or by the mirror. So as you magnify that image, well, you'll find that it gets softer and softer. So it loses a clear, sharp focus. I'll bet that most people using telescopes actually operate in terms of magnification somewhere between say 50 power and maybe 200 power. Rarely do we get above 200 power, but right in that sweet spot between say 50 and maybe 150, that's where you can do the best work with the sharpest, clearest images with the eyepieces that you would use for a telescope. Now that brings me to the other part of this piece about size. Now, when you're looking at a telescope, instead of being magnification that you're looking for, what you're interested in is the diameter of the opening at the front. The diameter of the opening here tells you the approximate size of the lens or the mirror that's gathering light. And for your price point, you want to get the largest diameter you can afford. Yes, right. Get the largest diameter you can afford. That way you have the greatest amount of light coming to be magnified by an eyepiece. So the way I say it is you can't magnify what you can't see. So if you're not gathering enough light, you don't have enough light to give you a good image that should then be magnified. So go with the largest aperture you can afford, okay? Great. Now, when we talk about going with the largest aperture you can afford, you might think that you'd like a bigger telescope. Well, a factor that you have to consider is how comfortable are you going to be moving that telescope around? So if you want to use a telescope that's a bit larger and you're going to have to transport it to a location where the sky is clearer and darker, think about how much the telescope weighs, the fact that you will be lugging it from the house to the car, and you also have to keep in mind that you need room in the car to fit the telescope. So those three things will help you determine what size telescope you really need. Remember, it's all about how ambitious are you? How much can you lift? How much room do you have in the car? Uh, along with, can I actually afford this? Okay, so those are the things that go together to help you figure out what you wanna do with a telescope, what you'd like to do. If you wanna look at stars, the moon and planets, think about a refractor. Very, very good refractors available. If you're thinking about those things, plus some nebulae and some galaxies, think about a reflecting telescope, okay? You can find plenty of examples of both of these at the Orion Telescope website. Now, one last pointer I'll give you about the reflecting telescope. I highly suggest you look for this particular style. It's called Dobsonian, Dobsonian. 
named after John Dobson, who came up with a particular design of what's essentially a tube in a box on a lazy Susan. That's basically what it is. But it works really, really well. And in reflector telescopes, that's where your greatest value is dollar for dollar in terms of how much aperture, the width of the front opening, you can actually purchase. Now, please ask me your questions. I've said a lot about this so far. I have a little bit more to go, but I want to make sure you send your questions so we can answer some of your questions. I'm going, I'm going to mention now about binoculars, and then right after that, we'll take your telescope questions. All right, here we go. So don't forget, give me your reflector questions or your refractor questions, and I'm going to talk about the binoculars right now. So here I have what would be considered a, a, a pretty sizable pair of binoculars. Yeah, those are big binoculars, aren't they? Well, these are specialized binoculars because they are binoculars for astronomy. These are astronomical binoculars. They're astronomically big. Yes, these are astronomical binoculars. Now, when you look at these binoculars, they're called binocular for a reason. And if you break the word up, you uh, can get the meaning by binocular binocular, okay? So what we have is we have two oculars, okay? We'll start with that part of the word first, two oculars. There's one ocular here and one ocular here. An ocular is the place where you look through a telescope or a pair of these things, right? So here's the ocular right here, okay? Now we have two of them together, so it's called binocular. Of course, you've got that, no problem. But let's look at it another way. I actually have two refracting telescopes right next to each other here. I have a refractor up here and I have a refractor right here. And so these two refracting telescopes put together make what we call binoculars, okay? Now these are specialized, I said, because they're astronomical binoculars. And what makes them specialized for that is if you look at the front lenses, these are very big for binoculars. You will hardly ever see binoculars, typically see binoculars this size. You'll see them much smaller than this. But these are getting up in size to the size of the reflecting telescope here. So that means they have greater light get, they have very, very good light gathering capability. They can gather a lot of light to deliver an image down here to the ocular where you will observe. So you have the two telescopes right next to each other. Now, if you're looking for binoculars like these, you might look for the size, but let me show you something else to look for. Right on the back end of the binoculars here, you might be able to see that there are some numbers there. And those numbers, two numbers, you'll see 15x and 70. 15x and 70. Now, let's take those numbers apart. The 15x refers to the magnification power. These magnify 15 times. So right here are the eyepieces that magnify the image created by the lenses on the front. And the magnification here is 15 power, so 15 times greater than true size. Or uh, uh, reduce it, you could, you could actually say it this way, uh, reducing the distance to an object by 15 times, okay? Making it appear that much closer, all right? So 15 power here. The second number, the 70, refers to the diameter of the front lens. And it's measured in millimeters, so 70 millimeters across each one of these. Now let's turn that into something useful. Millimeters per inch, 25.4 millimeters per inch. 25.4, so I got 70 here. If I divide that by 25.4, it comes out almost to three. So these are almost three inches in diameter. So you have two three inch telescopes one for each eye that you're using to gather light from dim objects and get a good look at them. Binoculars work really well for beginners in astronomy. If you don't know what kind of telescope you wanna purchase and you feel like it's gonna take you a little while to figure it out, you know what you should do instead? You should get yourself a pair of binoculars and start there. Why? Binoculars are far less expensive. Binoculars are very easy to aim and to point they're very easy to look through. You can use them to look at planets, stars, nebulae, and galaxies, depending how dark your sky is and how bright the nebula and galaxies are. Okay, let's make sure I get that straight. And the other thing about them is that you can use binoculars to observe almost anything else. So you can use them for sporting events. You can use them for 
bird watching, any of those sorts of things, right? So any of the normal uses for binoculars, you can use the any binoculars, you can use those binoculars also for astronomical observing. Now, the size that you might find more normally rather than 15 by 70 is you might find seven or eight by 50, seven X 50, eight X 50. You can even find 10 X 50. Now that's a good size and that would work really well. But anything above 10 power like these binoculars at 15 power, well, these are much harder to hold for a while because they actually weigh a few pounds. And the other thing about this is that once you get above 10 power magnification holding something like this, what you begin to see in the image is a movement where the binoculars seem to jump up and down. And that's really your heartbeat contributing to how you're holding the binoculars. So there's a couple of things to consider when you're thinking about binoculars. You might even have some binoculars right there at home that, uh, that you can turn into astronomical observing binoculars. All you'd have to do is add a star map. Now there's a star map, wow, <laughs> there's a pretty good one. Now we're gonna talk a little bit more about star maps in a moment, but I know we have questions about telescopes and binoculars. So let's see if we can do some of those questions from my uh, studio producer here, Linda. Any t uh, Jordan would like to know, do you have any tips for seeing Saturn and its rings through a telescope? Jordan wants to know if there are any tips for seeing Saturn and its rings through a telescope. Yes, don't try to go to too high a magnification. You want to stay somewhere around 70 power to 100 power in magnification on a telescope. And something that you need to know about telescopes that are extremely important while we're talking about this, Jordan, thanks a lot, is that one of the most important pieces of equipment on a telescope happens to be the little tiny telescope on the top called a finder scope. The finder scope makes it possible for you to find the object you want to see under low power and a wide field of view, while your main telescope will show you objects in a narrow field of view and at higher magnification. So it will be easier for you to find Saturn if you first sight it in the sky with your eye, then point the finder scope of the telescope at Saturn, make sure that's centered in the field of view, now you can look at the object in the main eyepiece where you might change out or adjust the eyepiece to give you a good magnification. So Jordan, great way to do it is just uh, find it first with your eye and then try not to go too high in your magnifications. Don't worry about the 150. If you're at 75 or 100, that's gonna be great. Even if you're below that, it's still gonna be good. So uh, take a look for it. And you better start as soon as the sky gets dark because Saturn doesn't stay up very long these days either. It sets pretty early in the evening. Okay, what's next? Thanks, Jordan. Sharon would like to know, what can she see with her 15 by 70? Sharon wants to see, wants to know, what can she see with her 15 by 70 binoculars? I'm glad to hear you have them, Sharon. So uh, not only can you see what uh, package is being delivered to the neighbor down at the end of the street, but you can also <laughs> see you can really get a great view of the moon with 15 by 70 binoculars. Oh my goodness, the moon comes into such crisp definition. It's so nice and clear to see, and you can see mountains and craters and ridges and all sorts of things on all over the surface of the moon. And the moon is a really good target to examine with binoculars because you can use your binocular vision to enhance the sense of height and depth in the craters and the mountaintops and things like that. So that's good. Planets, you know, Jupiter and Saturn look really good in a pair of 15 by 70s. It would be nice if you had more magnification, but these are more portable than a telescope. So 15 by 70s will work great for that. Uh, so you can see the planets, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, no problem. All the bright stars, even bright stars that have uh, companions like double stars, and some stars that have companions with color. You can see color in stars really easily with a pair of binoculars. And uh, hopefully you'll remember that if you can see the color in stars, you can determine something about their temperature relative to each other because of their color. So binoculars are really great for that. So there's a lot of different things that binoculars are good for. And Sharon, you know, you can find books and guides online that are specifically for observers who are working with binoculars. And believe me, there's plenty of stuff you can see. It all is dependent upon how dark your skies are. The darker your skies are, the more you'll be able to see. 
Thanks, Sharon. Great question. What's next? Ayana wants to know if there's any place that she can purchase um, or rent telescopes. Who is this again? Ayana. Ayana. Ayana has a really cool question. Is there a per per place where she could purchase or rent a telescope? Well, guess what? There are places around where you can purchase a telescope for sure. Let me warn you, if you go into a department store looking for a telescope, you're probably not going to get a very good one. The place I recommended, Orion Telescopes, is very good at telescope.com. That's just one of the places that you could consider purchasing from. I happen to like their website because it has a lot of information, but there's actually a store here in Pottstown uh, called Skies Unlimited, a local place. If you happen to live near Pottstown, uh, give them a call, see if they're open, go check them out. They're a local group. These guys know what they're doing. They're very helpful. They have great equipment. And it's a place you can actually go see a piece of equipment. Okay, so you have some choices. If you like to shop online, you can do uh, telescope.com. If you like to do it in person, you can try out Skies Unlimited. Now, Ayana, you asked about renting. You know, I don't know if there's a place where you can rent a telescope, but I do know this. A number of the local astronomy clubs here in the Delaware Valley allow their members to borrow telescopes from their telescope library. So if you became a member of one of the prominent clubs around the area, you could borrow a telescope right there. Now that's a really great idea, Ayanna, because the other part about borrowing a telescope is you might be able to borrow a number of different types of telescopes one after another and figure out which one works best for you. So I highly recommend you try it out and see if that works, uh, works well for you. Now, I said astronomy clubs around the Delaware Valley. Well, there are a number of really great ones. Let me see if I can rattle the list off from the top of my head and get them all. So there's, I'll do it this way, Delaware Valley Amateur Astronomers, DVAA at dvaa.org is a great club. Rittenhouse Astronomical Society is another really great club that you can find. Rittenhouse Astronomical Society, Delaware Valley Amateur Astronomers. Uh, let me see, Lee High Valley Amateur Astronomical Society up near Allentown is a fantastic club. They even have their own observatory that you can go visit at South Mountain. That's a really wonderful group. There's the Buxmont Amateur Astronomers that you could check out. Buxmont is a wonderful group. There is, let me see if I can get a straight, uh, South Jersey Astronomical Association is a really great group. Delaware Astronomical Society is a fabulous group. I know I'm missing one. It'll come back to you. It'll come back to me, yes. Uh, please don't hate me if I don't, if I don't remember which one. Uh, oh, I know, of course. How could I forget? Chessmont Astronomical Society. All really great groups, chock full of people who are extraordinarily helpful and looking to uh, share their knowledge and experience. But these, uh, several of these clubs also have telescope libraries. And as a member, you could bar borrow a telescope from one of those organizations. So think about that. You can find them if you just go online and look for uh, astronomical societies or astro clubs in the area, you'll come across the ones that are all around the area, wherever you are this evening listening to our program. Okay, great. So another question? Jay would like to know, can you see the International Space Station clearly with binoculars? Jay, that's a great question. Can you see International Space Station with binoculars? Can you see it clearly with binoculars? Yes, you can see it clearly with binoculars. You know, with binoculars, you can actually see the astronauts waving at you as they pass by. No, no, you can't. I'm just kidding. You'll be able to see it clearly. There's no question about that. But if you're talking about actually seeing detail, no, you need a telescope for that. And it's a little bit of a trick to actually follow International Space Station with binoculars because you have to capture it in the field of view and then hold it in the field of view as space station moves across the sky. Now, speaking of which, if you have a pair of binoculars, you have a great opportunity to test this out coming up next week because there are several passes of International Space Station over the Philadelphia area next week. In fact, I think there's a pass every day, at least one decent pass every day. The best one I could find uh, coming up, uh, the best one I could find in the next week is coming up on Monday evening, and that is gonna happen at uh, 
uh, oh, uh, 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 oh yes, uh, 73 degrees uh, above the horizon. So it's a very high pass right overhead. In just a few moments, I'll get you the details on that so you can copy them down and have the times when you're supposed to go out to look. So uh, binoculars will help. And you know what? Not only International Space Station, but there are lots of other satellites that can be seen with binoculars. And it's everything from spy satellites to weather satellites to uh, uh, communication satellites. All sorts of objects are visible with a pair of binoculars under dark skies. What's next, Linda? Okay, Joe would like to know, seriously, can he see the flag on the moon with a telescope? Ah, see, there's another great question. The question is, can I see the flag on the moon with a telescope? I really wish this were possible. You know, it's a, another one of those jokes that I tell about what you can see with a telescope. And I sometimes want to josh people and say that, you know, if you have a telescope uh, big enough, like ours at the Franklin Institute, you can actually see the astronauts' footprints on the surface of the moon. And you know what? Absolutely not. No, you can't see the flag. And you have to think about scale when you think about this, because you know the flag, the flag that was placed on the moon is only about so big. It's only about like this, not very big at all. And the footprints, the boot prints on the moon are only about this big. Now we're talking about trying to do an observation over 240,000 miles away from Earth. 240,000 miles away, and we're looking for something about this size, and it's a footprint? No. No, we can't see that, nor the flag either. Now, of course, the question would be, well, can't I build a telescope big enough to make that happen? Well, yeah, you could, but you know, you'd be gathering so much light. The light from the moon would terrifically overpower your telescope and make it almost impossible for you to see any detail on the surface at all. So the better thing to do for that is to go to NASA's website and look up their lunar orbital missions, their lunar reconnaissance orbiter, for example. And in the photographs taken by some of those spacecraft that have been orbiting the moon for decades, you can find images now that will show you the landing sites of the Apollo astronauts. And you can see what that looks like in detail from just 100 miles above the surface. That's difficult to see at 100 miles, let alone 240,000. So, bit challenging to do with a telescope, but wouldn't that be fun? What's next, Linda? Sherry would like to know, is there a good meteor shower this week? Haha, <laughs> Sherry, you're asking about a really fabulous meteor shower. Thank you for the reminder. I greatly appreciate it. It is the Geminid meteor shower. The Geminid meteor shower is the second most prolific meteor shower. I'm sorry. The Geminid meteor shower is the most prolific meteor shower of the year. It used to be that the Perseid meteor shower of August was the most uh, prolific meteor shower, but that's changed over the decades, and now it's the Geminid shower. The Geminid shower can show you up to uh, 100, 110 meteors per hour under good, clear sky conditions, and the peak of the Geminid shower is December 14th. So here we are at uh, December 4th, we're almost in the period of time where we can begin to see some of the Geminid meteors. Now, the reason why they're called the Geminid meteors is because as you could see these streaking across the sky, if you took a pencil and sort of drew a line across the sky in the backwards direction of the meteor as to where it came from across the sky, the origination point for all of these would end up in the constellation Gemini. And so that's the reason why they're called the Geminid meteors. Now, these meteors, of course, are not falling stars or shooting stars. They are chunks of dust and dirt, uh, little bits of dust and dirt uh, that have melted out of the, of the nucleus of, the com of a comet that has come through this section of space before. And every year, the Earth passes through that uh, cometary dust trail, and these particles fall into the Earth's atmosphere and we see them as these bright streaks that happen. Really cool thing about most of these is that most of them are about the size of sand grains or maybe a little larger pebbles, rarely a cobble size, you know, about the size of a potato. But when you get something that big, they tend to be really bright and we call them fireballs. And the Geminids do show fireballs as part of the, uh, as part of the shower. So any evening the sky is clear around the 14th, say the 12th through the 16th, if you go out in the evening and watch the skies, the best time, of course, to watch meteor showers, turns out it's between midnight and sunrise. But that's not the only time you can observe. Just turns out that that's the best time. 
But if you can only hang up until, say, midnight, well, go out at 10 and then again at 11. See what you can see of the geminid meteors as they zip across the sky. So uh, the geminids have the winter sky, the perseids have the summer sky. So uh, the geminids are the big shower that we can see this month. It's a really good one. Great. What's next? Barb and Dinette from the Chester County Astronomical Society says hello and to remind your listeners that they meet at Westchester University when there is no pandemic. Ah, hello there, Adapts. How are you? Great to hear from you. Thank you very much for joining me tonight. These are old friends of mine from the planetarium community, and we've worked together a number of times before. Thanks for saying hi. I really appreciate it. Now, wait, Linda, what did they say? Uh, to remind your viewers and listeners that the Chester County Astronomical Society there meets we go. at Westchester West University when there's no pandemic. Chester County Amateur Astronomical Society. Thank you very much for that, Don. The Chester County Astronomical Society meets monthly at Westchester University, of course, when there is no pandemic. So once this is over, if you go to their website and check out their meeting times and schedules, you can find out when they'll be meeting again. Another great group from the Delaware Valley. Don, thanks so much for checking in to remind me of that. I greatly appreciate it. Great to hear from you. What's next? Okay, great. So we'll come to some more questions later, but you know what? Let's go back to uh, one thing that we were talking about. Oh, don't forget to send me your uh, ideas about the films that you like. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to rearrange things here a little bit because I just want to make sure that I share my screen with you and give you the opportunity to check out some of the websites that I was speaking of. I got a few wires here. I just have to get together. Hold on. We'll make sure everything's cool here. All right, and uh, there we are. Okay, let me get a little bit of this. Okay, fabulous. Now, uh, okay, folks, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen here. So I'm gonna come out like this. I'm gonna go to my desktop. Please don't look at anything. Yes, it's messy, I know, but I wanna go out here because I wanna take a look first at the night sky. I wanna take a look at right out here at Stellarium. Stellarium, let me see if I can yeah, get what I really want here. I'm gonna go just about like this. That's good. And uh, one last thing I'll do here, if I can make that happen is jump right over here and maybe I won't worry about that. Let me just back out to here. Uh, there we go. Everything that I needed right there. So folks, this is a really great program that I like to use called Stellarium. Stellarium web, and you can see right up here in my uh, URL address bar, it's stellarium-web.org. This program is a really wonderful online map of the night sky. When it first comes up, as you can see it here, it's pointed toward the north. I'm gonna use my cursor to show you where north is. And I'm just gonna drag, click and drag to pull us around to look at the southern sky. Here we are right here. And I'm starting right here because if you go out to observe in the evening sky, if you face south, you'll have objects rising over on your left in the east, passing overhead as you stand facing the south and setting over on your right to the west. And that's the natural progression of the sky. It's actually the natural progression of the earth as it rotates underneath the sky from west to east. And at this time of the evening, it shows as 8.42 p.m., we can see that Mars is dead ahead right there. You can see it without any difficulty at all. And uh, while it may look, uh, it looks a little yellowish here on my computer screen, but when you get outside to see it, you'll see that it has a really lovely pinkish rosy color that really uh, lets you immediately identify it as being Mars. So that's a really cool one to see. Now, speaking of planets, you recall that I talked a little bit about Jupiter and Saturn, but they aren't in the sky. They should be over here in the Southwest. And I know why I can't see them they've already set. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the functions here to back things up in time. And I'm just gonna go back one hour. So I'm right over here in the lower right-hand corner. I'm gonna to go to 1943, which would have been 743. And I'm gonna go down one more right there to 1843. And you can see right here, Jupiter and Saturn are right next to each other above the southeastern, southwestern horizon right here. Now. If we were to run things forward here, and what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to let time run here. Oh, I think I uh, just put the wrong time here. Let me go back 17, 16. 
There we are. Now you can see where Jupiter and Saturn are right there. The next thing I'm going to do is I can let me see if I can move this box, but I can't move this box. And that's going to prevent me from showing you how the conjunction actually occurs because they're so close on the horizon there. However, don't worry about that because this map, as I mentioned, will allow you to adjust the time so you can go back and forth in date and time and see the sky whenever you wanted to see it. You can actually even make the sky, the sky larger or smaller. And here's what I've done with this. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some constellations so you can see how this program works. Now, right now, the main constellation of the fall sky is sitting right here in the center of the sky, right in the south. And again, this is at uh, 645. So you can imagine what it's like uh, two hours later. We'll jump back up to real time right here. There we are. And you can see that Pegasus has moved a little bit further to the west. Okay. Mars is sitting right here. But here are the winter constellations right over here in the southeastern portion of the sky. The center of the winter circle is Orion, surrounded by Taurus, Auriga, Gemini. Right over here is Canis Major and Canis Minor. Now you'll see the word Monoceros here, and that's true, but that's a dim constellation that has no bright stars that we can see very easily. But if you follow the three belt stars of Orion down to the horizon, that's where you would come to Canis Major and Canis Minor, where we find the brightest star of the winter sky. In fact, the brightest star of the northern sky is the star Sirius, right? So here's Orion with the winter circle, and here is the main constellation of the fall sky. Pegasus about to head off that one. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop this particular site here, and I'm going to go to a different one. Just a moment. Let's see if I can get this done here. There we go. And rather than uh, read my email here, what I'm going to try to do is come right out to here, and I'm going to go. Uh, there we are. I didn't, oh, there it is. oh, there it is right there. Okay, you asked about Space Station. So let's go take a quick look at uh, Space Station. I'm looking at the Heavens Above website that will give me a list of International Space Station viewing times. And here it is right here. But you know what? I think I'm going to use a slightly different one. I'm going to use uh, See a Satellite tonight. Here we go. This is a program that shows you where International Space Station would be in the sky above where you live. So it uses uh, Google Street Maps to find out what things look like right on your street. And then it puts these objects right in the context of what's on your street. So here's a view looking at a street and there's International Space Station going across the sky and that's tomorrow evening at 4.57 p.m. So there's International Space Station right there zipping across the sky. If we looked at a later passage, I can just select from the menu bar on the left. I can pick up this uh, rocket booster here that's passing across the sky tomorrow at 521 in the evening. And this particular program works really well for showing what you see here. It places a context for you that's in your neighborhood that makes it easy for you to not only see the path of the satellite across the sky looking uh, down from space, but as it looks if you were looking up at the sky from your neighborhood. Uh, this one is called See a Satellite Tonight. See a Satellite Tonight. You can see the URL up at the top here is jamesdarpinion.com satellites. But if you just search for See a Satellite Tonight, you'll come across that one. And that's a really cool one to use as well. Okay, next what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump right over here to the website that I wanted to mention to you earlier, that I did mention to you earlier, and that is the Orion Telescope website. And I bring this up just because I want you to see what it looks like, and I want you to see how much information they have about various kinds of telescopes. I've clicked on the Dobsonian style, and as you look through the list of Dobsonian telescopes, you'll see that there are lots of different ones. But I want to direct your attention right over here to the left hand menu bar, because on this left menu bar, you can actually choose the price point that will work for you. So if you choose, uh, if you find, if there's a price point you need, you can actually select the brand, the user level, what it might be good for, how you might want to use this telescope, and it will help you figure out what telescope is best for you. 
Now, here's the really good thing about Orion telescopes. It is this. While Orion is based in California, they actually have a warehouse right here in Pennsylvania. Yes. And so they can drop ship things to this region pretty quickly. I checked on the website just yesterday about how they are uh, delivering things. And if you purchase a telescope today, a friend of mine purchased telescopes yesterday, and they found out that the telescope is going to ship on December 11th. So they actually tell you when orders are going to ship. And right now, December 11th is looking pretty good. I would imagine we're a day later, maybe it's December 12th now, but you should try that out, check and see how, look at them to see what they have in there. Okay, so that's all the website stuff I have to show you this evening. Uh, let me just check and see if there are other questions. Marie would like to know, what was that very bright thing uh, a few mornings ago around 5 a.m. December 1st? Uh, east, southeast? Yes, Marie, thank you very much. You're asking about that big bright thing that was seen in the sky in the morning a couple of days ago, about 5.30 in the morning. I'll bet some of our other participants in the program have a good idea. And you know what, Marie? You actually have a good idea of what this is already because there are not many things that look like this. If you guess the planet Venus, Marie, you're absolutely right. That's what it is. That's the planet Venus. Venus is available in the pre-dawn sky for us to see nowadays without any difficulty at all, no binoculars, no telescope. And it looks a brilliant, clear white light. And you might suspect that maybe it's an airplane headlight or something like that, but no, it's actually Venus. And Venus is so highly reflective of the sun's light because of its cloud cover that completely surrounds the planet. So those upper decks of clouds are very reflective and it reflects the sun's light to us. And we see Venus gleaming, gleaming brilliantly in the pre-dawn sky. Thanks a lot for that, Marie. What's next? Ray would like to know, what are your feelings about the Arecibo telescope? Oh, was it Ray? Ray. Yeah, Ray is wondering what I'm thinking about the Arecibo telescope uh, in Puerto Rico. Let me uh, just give people, clue people in about this telescope. The uh, Arecibo radio telescope was an enormous radio dish that's set in a valley between three hilltops. And uh, this is a telescope that was mounted in Puerto Rico, and it has been doing fantastic, uh, fantastic, how can I say, it? Uh, doing just the, the best kind of astronomical research for objects using radio waves or using radar uh, in the case of planet studies. Uh, better than many other telescopes have been able to do because it's designed specifically for that. Uh, it has been operating, I think, for uh, about 52 years, this telescope had been running, but uh, it started to deteriorate in the last, uh, you know, half decade or so, and then it really began to fall apart earlier this year, and finally, just a couple of days ago, the big feed horn that hangs over this enormous dish uh, finally uh, crashed because the cables that held it to the surrounding towers, uh, they all, they snapped and the big feed horn crashed down onto the surface of the dish and destroyed it. Doesn't look like it's going to be replaced anytime soon. And that's a huge loss for the astronomy community. And, you know, this is really a great point of pride for uh, the folks of Puerto Rico to have this absolutely fantastic uh, research facility available there. Uh, so they're very sorry about its loss as well. So uh, other radio telescopes around, but we'll have to figure out something to fill in the work that this one did. What's next? Jay would like to know, can we still see the Neowise comet with a telescope? Oh, there's a good question. Jay wants to know, can we still see the Neowise, Neowise comet with a telescope? Under clear, dark skies, if you have a big enough telescope, <laughs> I'm going to say probably so. I haven't really followed Neowise as close as I could have. Um, but, you know, if there's any possible glint of it left, you're going to need a good sized telescope and dark skies to see it. What's next? That's it for questions. Okay, great, folks. So here's what we're going to do. Let's uh, just do a quick review of the uh, movies that I was asking you about and about uh, uh, some aspects of them. I'm going to take a moment just to sort of follow up on that because there's a couple of comments that I think are very important for us to consider when we think about the science that we find in films. So uh, let's just start with uh, one of my uh, very favorites of this group, not my favorite, but one of my very favorites of this group, and that's the film Interstellar. You know, just after Interstellar came out, there was a lot of discussion about how accurate the representation of uh, black holes was as it was shown in the film and also the questions about 
uh, the, the, the distortions uh, caused by uh, the gravity of a, on a planet being close to a black hole. I don't want to give any of the story away or you know, uh, tell you too much about it. I want you to see it if you haven't seen it. But one of the arguments has been that it wasn't depicted as accurately as it could have been depicted. Um, not saying that people made mistakes, but that maybe they could have uh, made it more accurate. Uh, made those depictions of the distortions caused by, caused by gravity be more accurate. And you know what, as I look at something like that, that particular aspect of this particular story, what goes through my mind is this. My questioning always is, does the accuracy of the science make or break the story? Does it help the storyline move along if the science is inaccurate? What's the real point of the film? Is the point of the film about the science or is the point of the film about something else? Now for me, Interstellar really stands out like that. And here's my own personal opinion. Now, while they worked really hard to get the science as accurate as possible, I don't think that they could have everything absolutely accurate. Why? How long would we be sitting in the theater waiting for the spacecraft to go from Earth all the way out to where it did to do the work that it was doing near the black hole? Well, there's that part. Okay, then the other part of it is, what's the point of the story? Now, to me, the point of the story is not about the black hole and the distortions of time and space, but it's about a human connection. It's about the lead character's desire to want to accomplish the mission and get back home to see his daughter again. That's what I think is the main piece of this movie the most important aspect of this movie. That's what I think the story is about. I think the science in it really helps to complicate it and make it really difficult for this person to make that connection again. But it just shows how determined and how important this connection was to him that he would do this to make that happen. So if you see the film or if you've seen the film, you'll understand what I'm saying. So for me, I don't think the point was about the science. Let's go to The Martian though instead where I find that science was the primary co-star in this film. This was all about the science. And what Matt Damon did was he was the person that facilitated the science to make it happen so that he could get back home alive. But when you put it all together, it also tells a really great story about how engineers go about solving a problem. They take one step at a time. They bite off the pieces that can be solved and solve smaller bits of the problem to solve the whole problem. And they work their way through the whole thing uh, to come to a successful conclusion. And in the case of the film, The Martian, you could see that working its way through the film all the way along. And that was the really important piece about this is that the science was the co-star here and the process of science was the co-star here. And Matt Damon made it all come alive. Now. Since we're running low on time, let me get right to my favorite, my favorite film. Of all of these, Forbidden Planet, The Day the Earth Stood Still, 2001 A Space Odyssey, all of these different ones. You know what my favorite one was? Ready for this? The Fifth Element. <laughs> yes, really the fifth element. Now, the others I think are really great films. Gravity, I really loved it. But you know why I like Fifth Element? I like Fifth Element because it's incredibly humorous. I love the humor in the film. I'm not necessarily uh, the biggest fan of uh, Bruce Willis, but in this particular instance, all of the characters around him, I think really helped to support this as a really fun film. And that's how I see it. I see it as fun in which the science is used to help move the story along. And the story really is about love. And that's something I find really uh, uh, wonderful that was put into this. There's the forces of good and evil battling across the universe, but love wins out in this. And the science really makes it sing. All of the great stuff that goes on there is just really wonderful. So uh, you should see it. I also, uh, I also love the fact that there are a couple of mistakes that are made in the film that you can hear in the dialogue as the film goes along. If you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, check out this film. It's really cool. Okay, great. So. Again, I still want to know what your favorites are. Send a note and I'll, I'll reach out to you and uh, just acknowledge, thank you very much for participating in our program this evening. You know, it's really great to have you as part of our programming for Night Skies at Home. 
I hope you found the information helpful and useful. Uh, we want you to be able to use this information to help you connect with the night sky. There's nothing like spending some time out under a nice, beautiful sky, either observing the moon, looking at some planets, or just looking at the stars. Maybe it will help to give you a sense of calm, a sense of relief, and uh, reestablish your connection with the universe. All you have to do is go outside, spend a few minutes looking up, and hopefully you'll be able to see some really cool things. Don't forget, we have the conjunction of planets, the Christmas star, as it's being called, coming up toward uh, later this month between December 16th and December 27th. Uh, International Space Station is making some great passes over the city next week. And so uh, on Monday, you'll be able to see International Space Station in the evening as it passes over Philadelphia. If you can't do the Heavens Above website, don't forget the other one, see a satellite tonight and just look for International Space Station coming up on Monday evening. You'll see which pass it is. And uh, take some friends out, take your family out actually to see it if the skies are clear enough to do that. Uh, and of course, all those other great sites that are available in the, e in the evening sky to see. We'll be doing this again next month uh, at the 1st of January, 2021. I know we're all looking forward to next year. I uh, can't come fast enough, but don't forget, we're also passing through the winter solstice this month on the 21st. And you know, when I start to see, uh, when I notice that the earliest sunsets are coming around this time of the year, here's the extra thing that happens. By December 13th, sunsets will begin to come later and later and later. So already we're gaining some extra sunlight, if you will, on the end of the day. By the time we get to the solstice, we will have added eight minutes of daylight to the day. We're still losing it on the front of the day because the latest sunrise doesn't occur until early January. So all of these things all help to make up uh, this progression through the winter portion of the year. And I hope you'll pay attention to it as you're enjoying the holiday season. Best wishes to you all. Uh, thanks for joining us this year. We really do appreciate your support at the Franklin Institute. We're closed right now but hopefully we'll be open uh, again early next year. And we look forward to welcoming you down to uh, the Institute to partake in all the great stuff that we have there. We know you've enjoyed it before. We'd love to have you come back. Uh, thanks again for your support. And uh, we look forward to having you back at the Franklin Institute again soon. Okay, so you can always check me out uh, on Twitter. My uh, handle is at Cool Astronomer. And you can uh, always drop your questions into the chat box here and I'll make sure I get to uh, respond to your questions uh, after the program. Thanks again for enjoying our program this evening. We really appreciate you being with us. Have a great holiday, have a safe holiday, and we'll see you again early next year. So long, folks. <laughs>